In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. In the Gospel that we read today, it's from the first Sunday of Lent. Christ, in a way, is giving us how to spend the time in Lent. This is a course on how you spend your time in Lent. When you think of the Lord himself, before he teaches anything, he did it. So I also know from this what Jesus did. You hear about him going early in the morning, praying, and lots of time he spent in the field, lots of time he spent in the mountain, in the desert. He doesn't really, um, he doesn't stay in a crowded place for long. He goes into a place which there's no people, and it's a wild, usually, place, maybe a forest, maybe a a valley, where nobody goes there, or a mountain. In the 40 days, he went to the desert. So what was Jesus doing in those 40 days? It's very intriguing to understand what was he doing, and to learn from him. You want to know what he was doing? Listen to him teaching. Because whatever he experienced in those days, He is coming to teach it. That's what anybody will do. And like a good father or a teacher, what he learned, he teach his disciples and children. Some of you might say, oh, Jesus is God. He knows everything. He can make the words even he doesn't know. No. No, please stop it. That's not a good idea at all. That's a heresy. Jesus had to learn to talk, right? Did he, was he born talking? No. He had to learn how to walk. Was he learned, was he coming out of the womb of St. Mary walking? No. So he had to learn everything from scratch. But one thing about him, there was no evil in him. There is no bad nature. He was the perfect human being that can be. Adam, as Adam should have been. So whatever Jesus learned in his life, this is what Adam should have learned, that each of us also will learn, and that each of us will be able to learn when we are clean inside of us, and we love God. So that's basically a course in humanity. You hear about people who are humanistic. They want to have pity on people. That's Jesus. He's very human, and human more than any human that we are. So, when he talks about this chapter, this is very beautiful to look at and think about what Jesus was doing as I think of it. So Jesus going out, there is a very interesting scene, if you've seen the movie ben a very beautiful story. In ben it's a story of a prince in the first century of, uh, from Judah who befriended a Roman, a Roman rich man and the Roman rich, rich man went to Rome and came back after many years and became the, uh, the captain of the guards. And now they are not friends anymore. And in this story, Jesus is, it's in the lifetime of life of Jesus, so there is a scene about the Roman legion coming through Nazareth. They're going through the streets of Nazareth. And they go by a shop of a carpenter. It was Joseph, of course, that's what he's saying. And a man standing there watching the Roman soldiers, and he comes into the thing. Have you saw the Roman soldiers? Why you're not interested? Have, we have seen them before. Not something exciting to look at. And he said, uh, oh, I see my table is not done. Where is your son? He said, uh, he's taking a walk in the mountains. And then uh, that's how the director wants to put it. And he says, okay, so... Don't you tell him anything about ignoring his work? He's supposed to be here working with you. He said, uh, all, every, all, every time I tell him that he needs to come and be in the shop, he says, I have to be after my father's business. So the man answers, so why he's not here? But as, as usual, Jesus' answer when they tell him, why you're not doing what you're supposed to do? He says, I have to be with in my father's business. So what's his father's business? This is it. So he's saying here, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
the business of the world. That money gathering is part of the business of the world. We want more, and this always ends up in a disaster. How many fathers ignored their family to go and gather more money and ended up losing the most important thing in his life? So this is, this is a story that happens until today. We still do the same thing. Some work very hard and because they have not the means. They cannot actually meet the needs of each, each month. But some don't. They only do it to get more. And this is a problem. This is a big problem. So he says, this is not going to end up well. Your money will be spent in a way you don't want it. Lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, he says, where neither moth or rust destroys, whether thieves do not break and, and steal. Where is that money? Uh, can be? How can you transfer that money to heaven? Simple one is to give. To give the poor. To give the needy. To give for the cause of humanity. Because he says, for where, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But there is also something else. He said, instead of spending your life and time in collecting money and working, let me show you something else. And here, here is something that's actually we're going, to, we're going to make everybody angry at him. He's, he's saying, okay, um, he, he starts by saying the eye, talking about the eye. The eye is the lamp of the body. How is the eye the lamp of the body? Because it brings light to us. If I close my eyes, I don't have any light. It's dark. But also it brings the world in. So if it is simple, if my eye is good and simple, the whole body would be full of light. But if the eye is bad, your whole body would be full of darkness. What does he mean? It's, an, it's a talk about the eye, but it's, it's a metaphor. So what do, you, what do you mean, Lord? So I'm going to not think about money, and I'm looking and to see how I use my eye to bring light. No one can serve two masters. He goes back again. For either he will hate the one, love the other, else will be loyal to the one, and despise the other. Jesus is saying you cannot have it both ways. You need to make your mind, make up your mind. You either love God or you love money. And he's saying it very harshly, putting it very, very harshly. He says, you will be loyal to one, and the other one you will, what's the word, despise me. Think little of. Ignore. Think of him as, or that other person, as insignificant. Can we think of God as insignificant? Yes. Jesus is saying it. Yes. We can. We do. If not in words, and we just get shocked when somebody says it, but actually in our actions, we ignore God completely. And for the sake of what? For another master. Then he goes on to say, therefore I say to you, it's, it's all connected. Don't think these are two different, three different pieces. One about the I, one about the money, and then go back about the, the money. Then he say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you'll drink, or what about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. He's saying, it doesn't matter what you eat. This is all would lead you to physically live. And this God is providing any way to the birds of the heaven and, uh, and the lilies of the field. That's what he's saying. Look at the birds. So I now understand where he goes, what he's doing. In those times that he spent in his walks, in his soul, solitude time, what does he do? I can imagine him bending over a little flower, touching it, looking at it, and looking at it really good. He might spend like maybe 10, 15 minutes, an hour looking at this one lily. What's Jesus doing with that one lily? He says, he's thinking about it. He's using his human mind that he has to build a library of information about his father. In addition to the connection between him and his father, he wants to see. One day he told the disciples and the people, he says, the son does nothing of himself, but whatever sees the father doing, he does as well. What does that mean? He, as a human being who grew up little by little, and his knowledge grew little by little, he needed to know how his father doing things. So he looked at the creation. He looked at each thing God did. And he asked himself, why would my father be interested in something like this? 
So he looked at the lilies and he said, wow, this lily is not moving from here. It's in its place since it was born until the date it was be gathered and there's not much time for it. It will be burned, but yet it is so beautiful. It's awesome to look at. How many of us will stop to look at the lily? Yet your heavenly father, he says, um, um, about the birds first, the heavenly fathers, they, they, he feeds them. How many of us would look at sparrows and think about what, what God did with them and how, what God is doing with them? And if you think about the Lord himself, he's like a bird. He's not tied at all. Nothing ties him. He lived 40 days in the desert, day and night, ate nothing, and was with the beasts. And the only company was the devil. He was hungry, lonely, thirsty, you name it. So if you think about him, he is like a bird, very free. And he says, but if you watch the birds carefully, they're well taken care of, very well taken care of. They don't have to worry about anything. And they don't have plans. We think our mind and our eyes can actually, we look around and see how people are doing. Oh, somebody has a house somewhere, we get a house somewhere. Apartment in the beach, let's get an apartment in the beach. Someone has a new car, let's get a new car. Someone has... When is this cycle, empty cycle, it's going to end? He says, be free. Let your eye guide you to something good, not to the patterns of the world that actually leads us to misery. And he says, these birds don't have any commitment to money. They're not committed to anything. Building stores and building big barns and opening new accounts and all that stuff. The birds don't care for that. But the Heavenly Father takes care of them. There is a plan for them. There is care all around the creation. And in every way they are covered. So he says, even look at yourself. By which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature. And he says, God already had decided what, what stature you would have. And if you, this is an anxiety. Sometimes I think about this and with myself and saying, if I'm anxious about something, how am I going to change it? Um, from this, I learned something like this. So I go into cycles. I think about the problem, and I go into finding out a solution for it. I can't. I end up getting what? An anxiety. So I go back to the beginning, and I start again thinking about it. Maybe I will solve it this time. You know that the mouse that's trying to get out of the trap, and every time they try to get up, they're actually more trapped. So this is it. He says, an anxiety, how is that going to help you? So once you go one cycle, and I've learned to do this, once you go one cycle into a problem, and you can't find a solution, what should we do? Just give it to him, and that's it. Don't have to think about it again. Because the only thing you're doing when you're thinking about it is turning yourself into... Neurosis and anxiety, don't do that. That's what Jesus is saying to us. And then he says, so why do you worry about clothing? He talked about food and he talked about the birds. And then he talked about clothing and he said, consider the lilies of the field. And I imagine him bending over as he's watching the birds and bending over to this lily. I don't think Jesus would pluck it, but he would bend over to look at it as his creation. And he would look at it and say, what would my father, the, the source of all things, be interested in to make this lily why is he thinking this way this lily is so beautiful some of them when I go when you go walking even here you see the clover and some of the uh, wild flowers that grows in the grass are so colorful crazy colorful some of them are very beautiful but you have to stop <laughs> that's the thing you have to stop to look at them I remember when I was, I had a retreat for a year, which was a luxury that I don't think it will happen again. And that retreat, I learned a lot about nature, not more, not mentally. There's a difference between you go and try to study what kind of trees grows in North Carolina, which uh, broad leaf and which uh, narrow leaf, that's not it. It is actually to immerse ourselves in the beauty all around us that God created. And to immerse yourself in beauty, there is some food there. There is feeding. The eye, that's what Jesus is saying, brings in, when you actually immerse yourself in nature, brings in love and brings in beauty and wisdom and 
care so that I connects us with nature, connects us with God through his work, you are looking at the most beautiful things that ever made. When any artist is trying to do any kind of combination of colors, think about it. Where do you get it from? Usually they mimic nature. They mimic nature. They try to find out what, what is in nature. If you try to get out of this pattern, usually you make something odd. I remember when we were painting the school, I tried to get the logo of the school on the colors of the wall, and we did it. It was very ugly. So we had to go back into earth colors. What's earth colors? The tones that is around us. So this is the beauty that actually God has implanted in nature that we feed on it. We feed on it. So when the eye looks at these things, we get... So this is not a waste of time. It's never a waste of time to... We measure our time by money, but Jesus is saying, measure your time by something different. By meditating, contemplating, looking at the work of God. And then he said... You, you would come to appreciate more the care that God gives to creation if you spend time looking at it. Now, if God so close the grass of the field, I'm talking about lilies, that means small, tiny plants that actually doesn't go up. It's not a bush, not a, a thorny rose. No, it is actually grass. If he could close it, close the, 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 the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, means very little time spent on earth. This is, he's saying, stop and think about this. There is very little time spent by these plants on earth. They don't live long. Two days, three days. It's a very short season. And then it's thrown in the oven. They cut it and they burn it. Will he not much more close you or you of little faith? So he's saying, now, if you put things together, would it be more important for God to take care of you or to take care of the lilies of the field? Therefore, do not worry, he says. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Worrying here is not caring. There's a difference between the two. And he said, that's what all people in the world are doing. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows what you need, all, that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. Whenever the kingdom is preached in the beginning, at least, righteousness comes with it. What's righteousness? Just to conclude with this. What's righteousness here? What it means to be right? That God sees us dear. That God sees us blameless, with no fault. And what is this? St. Paul is going to speak about it, and Jesus speaks about it. It's the beginning of our sonship to God. It has to be righteousness. What's righteousness? When, and this is actually very, very fit. When you go back to um, the book of Genesis, and I'm just going to conclude with this, we're done. And it's this chapter 15. Chapter 15, we talk about righteousness. Second time, the Bible speaks about righteousness. God has given Abraham three promises. He told him, you know, I will come out of your family, your country, your father's house, and I'll make you a great nation, I'll make your name great, and I'll make you a blessing. Three things. Then Abraham went to Canaan. He was 70. By the time this story has been told, Abraham is 90. So 20 years later, after Abraham had followed God's instruction, came out of his land. Then, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. His name was Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. He was afraid. He was anxious. Why was Abraham anxious? The answer would tell you. And Abraham answered the Lord and said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing, he is seeing himself, that I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer, of Damascus. Eliezer was his high servant, his, his head servant. Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So he's saying, Lord, no offense. I didn't mean to doubt your promise, but I now understand it's not me who's going to be the reason for me to be father of nations. It will be my servant. 
I understand. You're, you're, you're absolutely truthful, never going to lie. So you promise me kids, it will be Eliezer who, who would give me the kids. God's going to do this three times. Three times he's going to speak to him about this one issue. And each time he's going to give him a little bit more. So, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him again, saying, This one, your servant, shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body. St. Paul catches this thing and said, he had hope. He believed that God would make him a great nation. He was hoping that this great nation would come from his own flesh. But he was anxious. Maybe it is not me. Because God didn't specifically mention my name as the source of this nation. Then God did something that Jesus is asking us to do today. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven. The answer of my anxiety, the calming of my anxiety happened by just enjoying the night sky. He said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Jesus tells us, look at the birds, look at the lilies and learn. The Lord said to Abraham, look at the sky and believe. And then it says, and he, with a small edge, believed in the Lord. And he, with a capital H, accounted to him for righteousness. This is righteousness. So when Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he speaks about when we look at God's care for creation and we see the patterns, how the creation was very well and very purposefully and, and meticulously made with certain care and love in it that we learn for ourselves that God will take care of us. And by this, then what do you mean? And I'm going to ask this. How, did, how do we know that Abraham believed? There's no words here. He didn't say to the Lord, I mean, I believe, like we say in the liturgy. How do we know that Abraham believed? What does it mean that he believed in the Lord? No words. Simple. He was anxious, and after he looked at the sky, what happened? His heart calmed. And God saw it. He saw his heart. And he said, that is the one I need. That's the one I'm going to train to be the father of the priests, the, the, royal, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, that he will serve everybody else and bless them. This is the one I will look at. So that's exactly it. So Jesus today is telling us in the Lent, make less time for anxiety and work. Make more time for looking at God's work. Meditate on his creation. Abraham had no Bible, so he had to look at God's work in creation. He lived in a, in a tent, in an open place, lot, lost a lot when he went into the city and lived in these houses, the man-made stuff, and everything he sees is human-made, and he lost. But Abraham lived in this wilderness. It was in a tent, and he, he spent a lot of time within nature, and he knows. And by the way, if you read the chapters 12, 15, 17, 18, 22, those, those four or five chapters, you will understand that the, 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 the word of God, whatever God says to Abraham, has been chewed day and night. He would not leave it. Every single, single word God said quickly. When Sarah's name was not mentioned. So you understand why Sarah had to give him Hagar. When Sarah's name was not mentioned in this, what did Sarah say? Oh, he told you, you will be the source of this descendants, but he didn't mention my name, did he? He said, no. And I'm sure it was very sad. He didn't know what to say to her. God said, it will be from my own body, but he never said that it will be from your body. He said, okay, if that's the case. And they were thinking about it day and night. Here's my slave girl. Then God wants you to have a child from her, God Ishmael. This was not, a, and uh, what is the word I want to use? Um, a human all 100% human made inclination to do this. But then in chapter 17, God comes back and says, Sarah will be the one, and you will have one from her. Okay, what about Ishmael? He said, I'll take care of him. He's going to be blessed. He's your son still, but it is Isaac. And then the final one, God says, okay. So God told him it's Isaac is going to be the reason. And the final one says, give me Isaac to kill him. Sacrifice Isaac. Everyone is squeezed what to do. This is the righteousness. He believed God 100%. So how Isaac is going to be a father after he dies? 
explain this to me. How? He's going to kill him and burn him. And then Isaac continues to be the reason for him to be, to be a nation, father of nations. How is, how is, what's the solution? It has to be very specific. That's it. He believed in the... There's, there was no way. He said, if God told me he will be the reason, not Ishmael, and he called him my only son, and he promised me that through that son I will be a nation, then he's telling me to offer him on the Moriah. The only way out of this, because God cannot lie, and he believed God 100%, trusted him 100%, the only way out of this is the resurrection. That's it. it never happened before. So by him meditating and thinking about the word of God, day and night, he was proven to be the man of God, the one who would be entrusted to be the head of God's family. That's how it is. That's called righteousness of faith. Today, we have plenty of things to think about. You have, in addition to nature, you have God's word. You have the Bible. That's why in the Lent, we double or triple the reading of the Bible. And we think about it day and night. We don't leave it, like Abraham and Sarah. We just keep thinking about it. What did God mention? What did he not mention? Don't assume things that God did not mention. That's not faith. That's called presumption. You need to really carefully read the word of God and understand exactly what God had promised. And if you don't understand it, ask, search, but don't let it be. That's what we, where we lose. And that's what Jesus is talking about for this week. Free your time, free yourself, so you can actually offer yourself, your heart and mind and eyes to the Lord so that he can use them to teach us. To him is the glory, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, now forever.